Good day. Welcome to Plain Talk. I am Philip Edward Alexander, and I'm joined in studio today by one of the best known environmental activists in this country. He is a successful businessman, among other things, and he's here to share his views on a lot of them. Gary Abood. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Been long in coming, this, this conversation. And um, we're going to take a very short break to do our intro. When we come back, we're going to get right down to it. Gary Abood. <laughs> You're jotting notes like me. We're not going to have enough time in this hour. Why activism? But before, before we talk, but what I would like to say is that um, two things. I wanted to congratulate you and your supporters because I've followed almost everything that you've said. And there's a phenomenal amount of empowerment and accuracy that you bring to the table. Um, I think that is absolutely commendable. I've, l I've listened and hoped that we could have more public commentary on a lot of the outrageous things that we take for granted. And your group, and you in particular, have been extremely energetic at risk of all of the things that come with that. So my hat's off to you in that area. And Thank I you for that. I wish you all the best in the upcoming journey of the elections and all of the things that are ahead. Well, I mean, I, I think you, you skipped ahead because, like you, I started off as an activist, right? And um, but I wanted to, I wanted to know, and I want them to understand why people and people like us and people like you. So I wanted, in your words, why somebody like you who are so successful? I mean, other a lot of people know you and your businesses, and they know you're successful. You travel the world. I called you the other day, and you're in China. I mean. Why are you not just enjoying your life? Why care? Why stop to look back? Why put yourself at risk? Why go to Guanapo dump to talk about issues that the people who it is affecting not seem to be giving a damn? Why activism, Gary? God, Philip, I have a bad tendency to become very emotional about subjects like this. Um, so I don't want to get upset about it, but... It's 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 very personal, and I maybe it's because of my upbringing or friends that I've had, or perhaps the lady that raised me at home. But um, I never like bullies, and I think a lot of the problems that we have and the neglect of dealing with the problems that we have is tantamount to being bullied. Oftentimes, you have administrative bullying by neglecting to deal with a problem that affects one party and paying attention to the same problem in a lesser degree of another party is a type of modern discrimination that isn't called discrimination, but it's a discrimination of neglect. And it bothers me. I don't know why it bothers me. Yeah, but you see, what, the reason I'm asking here, somebody like you in an environment like this, I mean, we've not shaken off colonial trappings for a long time. You wouldn't have the hurdles that someone from Morvan beat them love until and see lots would have. Why, why should you care? Why why should you care when so many don't? I don't know. Sometimes I wish I didn't. I could just go and relax and enjoy and, and enjoy a, a gluttony. Yeah, but, I feel um, that. But I, f I feel good when we do something good and I feel a, a sense of victory. It's a strange thing to say but when Patrick Manning used the word sustainable in the you know, in the last night before the election that he won, um, we celebrated because we had been using the word in the nineties. So to get to get a politician to use the word sustainable, just the use of the word, 
to bring it into the local vocabulary was an achievement. You thought it was an achievement? Yeah, that's a you major... You thought he was using it correctly? Well, he didn't use it correctly, but just the use of the word introduced the word into the local poly. Now it's used incorrectly in every different forum. So we talk about sustainable energy and the sustainable quarries and the things that cannot be sustainable by nature of what they, what they are. We're using it, to, but just the introduction of the word gives us hope that perhaps one day we would see beverage containers built, which is based on sustainability and the idea of... So, so sometimes small victories, as my deceased friend Jimmy Singh, Dawan Singh, of the Communication Workers Union, used to say that we have to celebrate the smallest of victories because they're so, so difficult to have even a small victory that we can build a movement based on small steps even though we may not see it, he said, in our individual lifetime, we must celebrate those small steps. I used to say, but we don't have a lifetime. We can't. We don't have that time. But in the larger scope of things, maybe maybe that's what we have to do. But, we have to but Gary, what, what do you say to people that think, but white man, this don't bother you. You could pack up and go and live anywhere in the world. I mean, you understand what I'm trying to tell you? We have a very... I, 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 underdeveloped psyche as a country so our collective speak is disappointing people don't rally around the important causes and i think that that is why it is so difficult to stand i remember when you were protesting the destruction of invaders bay and i remember yeah. reading a minister of works and a prime minister i call nobody name today saying that they will move the mangrove and then they will put it back. And I thought, what insanity. How, how could you believe that it is possible to move an entire ecosystem, build buildings, and then put back the ecosystem? Where in the world has that ever been done? And the, and, and the public just accept that. The public just move on with that actually put it into law that they, that there would be something called a no net loss of mangroves. It means that if you take out mangroves here, you would replant the equivalent amount of mangroves elsewhere. But what about everything that was living in the mangrove that you knew? Yeah, yeah. What happens to them? Yeah, yeah. We're building impossible dreams. We, we're creating illusions. So we write a law to fool people? Yeah, to, to appease people and fool them in at the same time. It's, it's dishonest. But uh, but I, I hope that there are people listening to the program, and I, I believe, and I've met many of your supporters, I think that there are, f there are people out there who have what is called social conscience. There are a lot of people who have social conscience. But what I don't understand but is... not enough. There are people who, when you drove to Guanapo to go and do your video to raise the issue, because I didn't know about it until you went. And when I did a video calling on the mayor, the mayor did a video after saying, well, it's not really her responsibility. I wanted to answer her that the point that you were raising is that the fact that it was poisoning her burgesses is her responsibility. Yeah. But I'm having that argument because if you've woken up enough to go and defend yourself, get involved. I have no problem with that. I'll take all the political attacks. I have no problem with that. But the people who are watching you that dismissing the point that you're raising for partisan issues, do they understand that they are ingesting carcinogens in the groundwater, in the air that they're breathing, that 20 years from now, after this little political victory they get, do they understand that they could be diagnosed with multiples of cancers? Yeah, yeah. And last year we had Aaron Balgobin's report uh, coming out of UTT. As a result of, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar, Aaron Balgobin did an analysis of the frequency of people who get cancer having a correlation of the frequency of their eating fish. And it found that frequent eaters of fish of the Gulf of Paria have a, 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 a six times more greater average of getting one of the many types of degenerative diseases, including cancer, compared to people that don't eat fish regularly from the Gulf of Paria. So that is critical and it requires serious analysis and further study. The government's position as well is not conclusive. They don't agree with the report. But the report was produced and published 
internationally, not locally. Why not locally? But internationally, peer reviewed. So they got he got professors and technical people to look into what he was claiming and to verify that it's a credible study and peer reviewed. It's the highest form of yes. publication. Since that time, what our honourable government, this government, and the board of UTT, headed by an energy sir, the energy sir, Ken Julian. Yes, what they did is they dismantled the laboratory where this student produced this report. Sent the professor who who gagged who, it. Yes, they they, they busted they up the laboratory. They gagged it. Twenty-seven million dollars worth of green fund and, equipment and, 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 and split up in engineering and every department. So they splintered the laboratory. Laboratory. They sent the professor on pre-retirement leave two years in advance. And the professor is an internationally renowned statistician. She has been sought of after in England and Europe and Germany and all over. She's worked all over the world. She came back here to contribute to our country in her 50s. She sent on early retirement. And the study has been smothered and the IMA come out and make a statement that is inconclusive. Who in the IMA is more qualified than the peer-reviewed professors who published the study? And it's just smothered. Likewise, in the Gulf of Paria, we produced a report at our personal expense to show that there's significant danger five years before Aaron Balgobin's publication to show that there's significant danger the professor wrote of consuming Gulf of Paria fish because of the presence of hydrocarbon contaminants, the polycyclic aromatics, that's benzene and seven. No, actually, it's about 30 of the of the polycyclic aromatics that are that are dangerous but seven of them are confirmed who is responsible to bring that information to the public well we took it to the public no, but besides you who in public life who in public office what department of state has a responsibility to the well-being and health the minister of health but i mean they're treating cancer and we're struggling with the resources to treat cancer but what is the cause of the cancer there are simple things that we need to look at. For instance, there's no study to show in Trinidad what is the danger of living next to a highway where the rubber of your automotive tires is powdering and people that are sleeping next to highways that are breathing this... Chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. One of the leading causes, COPD. Gosh. Bronchial diseases. Yes. So, so I, I feel... But it is, their, it, is, uh, it is supporters of the government. It's supporters of the government that are put. I mean, I remember all these years when the when the the dump in in Beetham keep catching fire. It's and, gonna catch fire again. And you drive through that, and your windows up, and even with all your windows up in your high end vehicle, the scent and the is coming in your vehicle. Yes. The people who live in across six yes. six lanes of pitch who are breathing that as their normal. Normal. What's going to happen to them? Check the frequencies of cancer rate. Um, back in the 97, there was a study produced by Dr. Hamid Farabi, who was, I believe, an Iranian professor at UWE, and Dr. Hollis Charles, um, who became professor, I believe. And that study was published in Jamaica, not here. They refused to give me a copy of it here. Then I got a copy of it from a Jamaican who ended, who attended the professorial lecture there. And what it did, it was a comparison, 97. It was a comparison between degenerative diseases, statistics in the four communities at the back of the Point Lisa's industrial estate compared to four communities on the north coast, Toko, um, um, uh, um, 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 Grand Rivier, um, Maclot, and another community. And so they comparing the frequency of degenerative diseases. And one of them, one of the degenerative diseases I remember, which was tuberculosis, was a frequency of 22.7 times more than, than, and then shortly after, like eight years later, there was so an you're five times more likely to develop something like TB living in... 27 times more. Wow. And then a few years later, when the Pandey regime was in power, there was an entire fire station. There were 23 officers that got tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis... In Trinidad. 
Yes, TB is real in for No, that. but you're saying that an entire battalion of firemen yes. got tuberculosis yes. because of location and environment. Because of location and environment. And nothing's been done. Nothing's been done to look into. And the villagers and the communities and the fence line communities are pointless. As nothing's been done to alert them to alert them to the danger that they're raising their children in in a danger zone. There's never even been any discussion on it. We took the the, the report and we produced three hundred copies of it. We sent it to every office and agency, everyone who could be considered a who's who. If we got three acknowledgments of receipt, we got a lot. We need a lawsuit. We need a class action lawsuit on behalf of those fire services. Erin Brockovich, remember that name? Um, Julia Roberts had made a movie where they found water was because of contaminants from heavy industry. And in the negotiations around the table, one of the women who was speaking for the company that was supposed to be liable, they were having a marathon session in and in, in back and forth and then she said look there's no way for you to prove this all of it is hearsay we don't believe that the, the, that, that, that the groundwater is causing the contaminant and julia was saying, okay no problem the last couple of hours you've been drinking water from that stream so if you believe that you have nothing to worry but she gave she ran out of the room because she was drinking the very water that she was saying that was safe for other people to drink and, I, and i'm saying a class action lawsuit came out of that and the people and then there's flint in the United States right now. And there are other examples of that globally in the civilized world. And Trinidad and Tobago wants to consider itself potentially a developed or a first world nation or aspiring to be developed and a first world nation. But we cannot protect our public, our people, the government, whose only job is the well-being of the citizenry. They do not want to take the steps necessary to protect the people from environmental hazards caused artificially. Yes, we need a we need a, a, a litigation on it. But the, yes, the Progressive Empowerment Party has spoken about something called an environmental bill of rights, and I wanted to talk to you about that and people like you to say what should be on that bill of rights. I know Singapore now has a fifty-fifty green space law that you can't develop anything more than fifty percent. You can't move fifty percent of the trees. You can't cut down a tree without permission from the state. And, and, and I was hoping to get at some point, not condensed in this interview, but I was hoping to get a conversation with you and others, like-minded people. If you, even if that's just one thing that we advocate for, if we get enshrined into the Constitution an animal bill of rights and an environmental bill of rights, we could start taking positive steps towards becoming a first world nation. Yes. Yes, the big challenge is to get our people empowered, not just three percent or five or ten percent how to get the whole nation empowered so that they see beyond the political landscape into a nationalistic landscape instead of being you know, sectorial be national that is something that we haven't succeeded at because people are divided when we came you've asked me to come on this program over the past six months at least six times and every time i've asked members they say no because this is a political forum. So when I came here, I was instructed over and over, and I'm going to take the opportunity now to say that we are non-aligned. Although in my personal capacity, I support the work that you've done. I'm not a supporter of the PNM or the UNC or the... No, but we don't bring people here looking for support from them. You know. no, what I do, this, what this, this show does, is that we look for critical thinkers in everything, in 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 the economy, in finance, in the environment, in healthcare, we bring the heads of the police service, the fire service, the prison service, we've spoken to all three. We bring ex-parliamentarians and we want to get to the root as to why this country fails. I say nothing works in Trinidad and Tobago. And we have now a, a library of interviews of people like your good self who I don't care was your political leaning. I care what is your consideration for Trinidad and Tobago. Yes. Because at the end of the day, we could call ourselves what we want. If the collective ship sink, red jersey, yellow jersey, green All jersey, orange jersey, wet. So it doesn't matter. And I keep asking the question, how do people allow the brainwash into thinking 
that half a ship could sink and the other half could go its merry way. It's a physical, technical impossibility. But we allow it. We're lazy thinkers. Gary, we're lazy, lazy people. We're selfish. We're driven by immediate grat gratification so that we don't think beyond the plate and we don't think beyond the bed. We don't think beyond what I want right now. That's why our transmission of HIV is so high. Because we don't think beyond what I feel right now. And that's what keeps us as a little Neanderthal colony. Because Trinidad and Tobago, we were talking before the show started, of how blessed this country is. There is something called the, gro the gross domestic product, the GDP of a country, that's supposed to guide the economy and the development of the country because you use taxation and legislation to guide the development of a country. But the income is the foundation. When they talk about the treasury and the treasury empty, there's no room nowhere full of money. There is a cash flow. There is money in and money out, like a normal business. There are the, start, the, the recurring expenditure of running Trinidad and Tobago and all of the opportunities to make money. When I tell Trinidad and Tobago, we have Carony Limited. When Manning and Rahal shut down Carony Limited, how long ago was that? Let's say 15 years have passed. In those 15 years, Carony lands have been pushing up razor grass, bush, and a couple cineplexes. But it's enough land that we could have planted mangoes, guava, avocado, soursop, breadfruit. Those are very hardy, sustainable crops. Those are crops that will bear for 50 to 75 years. Mango, Jamaica making millions with mango. Um, avocado, Mexico makes 1.5 billion US a year just shipping avocado to the United States of America. Trinidad Tobago could be earning money. A guava has five times the vitamin C of an orange. A breadfruit. A breadfruit could feed a family of four for little or no money. It is the only starch that is low glycemic, so it stabilizes your sugar in a country that has some of the highest diabetes counts in the world. We're not having these conversations. We drive through and look around this country as if the devil could take tomorrow. And it seems the devil here. Yeah, well, the devil is alive and well. As you, you're touching on point here, I want to in, interject and say something. The energy conference is taking place right, right now. now. Right, right now. now. There were a few a few years ago we were invited to speak at the energy conference. Um, well, after we spoke, somebody came to me and said we made a great presentation, but the only comment that they would have to make to us is that as long as we live, we would never be invited again. And it's true. 20 years have passed, we've never been invited back. Today, however, we got, um, five or eight years ago, we got invited to sit on the Trinidad and Tobago Extractive Industries Transparency Institute, which was secretly set up by the World Bank, because the World Bank has such a bad reputation, they don't want to be seen to be involved. involved. Um, and what it is, it's a partnership between civil society, the extractive sector, and government agencies that is supposed to be chaired by a civil society. Say leader. more about the extractive sector so the viewers can understand what you well, mean. Well, the extractive sector is oil, gas, and minerals. Anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. So and they're here in Trinidad. Well, here we have oil, gas, and aggregates. But they're on the ground in Trinidad. Of course, yeah. on the ground in Trinidad. So we have BP and Shell and EOG that that have volunteered to Signatories. comply. They comply and they sit. Are they signatories there? Yeah, yeah. Right. And the signatories sit in, in that they share their documentation. But all the EITI does, when it was set up, and the office and the headquarters is in Oslo, which conveniently never want to allow FFOs. We've applied and we've been nominated, and but they don't want us to represent civil society on an international scale because of what I'm about to say. So what the EITI does is it sets its scope to protect the treasury of the nations that have extractives. So when an oil and gas company or an extractor extracts a volume of the mineral, they have to pay a value. And that value, when they sign it off on their accounts, is supposed to be received by the sovereign nation. How so is that a, a how is that aligned to carbon credits? Or is that the same thing? Nothing like carbon credits. Okay. This is just tracking that you took a pot of coffee and you're supposed to pay five cents for it. No, it's not a determination of what value you're paying for what volume you're taking. 
It is only a deterrent. It's an accounting. It's an accounting process right. that you're supposed to, you paid, not what you're supposed to pay. You paid $5. Did we, the home nation, receive $5? Now, our argument is that is a fraud because what you have paid is not a comparative value compared to what you've extracted. You've extracted. So you could take 50 cup of coffee in Trinidad and pay one cent. But in America, you take one cup of coffee and you have to pay 10 cents, which means that the U.S. would be paid 20,000 times more of a, of a value for the, resources. for the equivalent volume. Right. So that is what we started on the EITI for. We want to know what value we are getting for what volume. And that is the international secret. But it's got worse. It got worse because we got the EITI to report on particular things that are occurring that we and all didn't even know. For instance, the quarry sector don't have anybody determining what volume they are taking out. Nobody checking to see how much they take. All we are checking is to see how much they paid and whether we receive. But how do you determine what they're supposed to pay? Bringing us back to sustainability. You know, bring up, of course, like my good friend Fitzgerald Hines, who liked to grand charge Rastafari. He's a good guy. You know, he's a, he's a roots man. He is a lifetime member of the Quarry Association. They appointed him as a Minister of Works, responsible for monitoring what they are taking from us. As he's a member of himself, to himself. He's a lifetime member of. Chile, I just don't understand the contradiction so, of those things. So, it gets worse than that. They owe hundreds of millions of dollars in royalties. What if they go out of business? Disappear. It's such so what, what, a mess. Who gets that hundreds of million dollars? They can't recover it again. It's such a mess. Gary. But Fitzgerald is a lifetime member. Now, so he, he is a member of the organization that and the government is supposed to be overseeing. That he and is he supposed is to be overseeing. Himself too. Because he's the Minister of Works. So well, and that he is patronizing. Because the Ministry of Works is purchasing a lot of things from the Quarry Association, all their roads and materials. But it gets worse than that. The Auditor General seemed to have, you know, sometimes a thought can develop in different places around the planet at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thought can develop in different offices at the same time. I never knew, never spoke to, and would love to meet the Auditor General. But for the past four years, the Auditor General has been saying in his annual report that this country, he, as the chief accountant responsible for determining what we get into our treasury, he does not know how to evaluate the royalties. There's no for, there's no formula for for oil and gas yeah. because no one in the Knows. ministry Correct. is checking. And I've asked how much oil and gas they take. But I've asked this question. But this I've asked this question before, Gary, and I want to ask you. I want to ask you who knows which department of state is aware of how much of our mineral wealth has really been extracted over 57 years. Well, the oil and gas companies... No, we're talking about in our country, in our state. We accept... This went to Parliament with both you are asking questions and the people from the Ministry of Energy admitted that there's no verification, but the Auditor General himself said for four years running. So it means that when... So we could have had a hundred times the money for our oil and gas that we've had. We could have had a thousand times. We don't know. There have been rumors. It gets worse than that. Mm -hmm. It gets worse and worse and worse. Talk. It, it, I mean, it just... I just say it's that, just that, that if Canadians only approach the conversation from money, I want to keep bringing it back to money. I want them to understand this. That everything that's wrong in this country, when you raise it as an issue, they raise the issue of money. And money, if money could solve all of these problems, and our money is being stolen at the top, before it even reached the treasury. Yes. So you have a budget and you say $60 billion and half of the $60 billion is stolen. Yeah. I am saying that $60 billion should be $300 billion. We do not have an idea of our actual yes. income. That's, I, I would say that's a fair Somebody assessment. Somebody told me that 10 years ago, an oil industry professional who's now based in Dubai, he told me that because he was based in a multinational in Trinidad Tobago. And he told me that, and I published that. And government ministers at the time said it was a lie. I said, if it is a lie, that you cannot prove how much oil and gas is extracted from Trinidad Tobago, then prove it. Then say, 
because that's all it takes. Right. Tell us, one barrel is sixty dollars, and we put out ten thousand barrels. Don't tell us we were paid for ten thousand barrels. I want to know how many. There's barrels no verification of the tap. And that's what the Auditor General is saying. So when So that's what was at the at, at the basis of what just took place with A V oil. And somebody said to me, A V oil is joke. It's joke. It's joke. The whole so hundred million dollars and is joke. And I am arguing to you that this Prime Minister and the last Prime Minister are fully aware of it. Both of them. Both of them. And the ministers of energy. And they let it pass. They try to deal with it. But it's too big. The system is too big. And the, and the energy companies finance the political parties, the mainstream political parties, so that we lost. We lost it. And the people in the country are so div divided that they don't seem to care. As long as their red or their yellow gets into power, they can keep as much as they want. And there's even a large sector, more than 50% of the country, that believe corruption is okay. So we're in a kind of a quandary. It's a, a mad place. It's a moral... It's a mad place. For you to defend, for you to say, when I raise the issue of the half a billion dollars on the Red House, and somebody tell me, yeah, but the UNC wanted to spend a billion. I had to say in an interview on 95.5, don't tell me what UNC stole or could have stolen as a defense for what the PNM is stealing or could be stealing. Yeah, yeah. We need to stop it now. Yes. Nobody should be stealing. Yeah, people tell me that all and say, yeah, but they're stealing less than the UNC. Well, how does one evaluate that? Or does that make it right? And how, how does the disconnect happen that they don't realize that what they're stealing is from them? Yeah. How do you get children yeah, yeah. to understand that their children should be wealthy? That the average person in Trinidad should be worth a lot more money than they would now? That we should be one of the wealthiest nations on planet Earth? We should still be. We should still be. We should be leading the world in industries. This dot in the sea. This dot in the sea. If other countries had the pitch lake that we have, it would be on the cover of National Geographic every month. But instead of us monetizing and, and, and maximizing the potential of that facility, we have government after government taking pocket bribes to sell it yeah. on behalf of the people come and loot your pitch lake and sell it to somebody else. Fishermen, friends of the sea, we have a nylon pool. Gary, does anybody else in the world have a nylon pool? If the Bahamas or the Virgin Islands had a nylon pool, they would have shows on Discovery Channel about the nylon pool. It's a wonder of the world. We don't care. We have boats dragging anchors, killing the reef in Tobago. Nobody wants to put floating jetties to facilitate both the tourism and come back to your word sustainable. Come back to your word sustainable. We live in this country, like Trinidad, is one big dead buffalo. And all of us are hyenas and vultures and lions and wolves. And everybody just come in to take their bite. At some point, the carcass will be empty of meat. What do we do? In my opinion, the fundamental problem we have in Trinidad and Tobago is an individual problem where people, our people, here, seem to have lost their way. I'll give one example. 20 years, 25 years ago, I went and I studied um, for one month. I did four separate programs, intensive programs, only in which, mainly which were graduate students or senior government personnel it um it was put on by the world ecotourism society uh, of which i have an interest especially being from trinidad there were four delegates sent from trinidad each one to attend a different component of the study one of them was sita who i still maintain a friendship but and she attended more classes than anyone else and then got very ill and so missed a lot of time. But what was really interesting is that the Trinidadians who were sent, senior government administrators sent to this, to this training program at tremendous expense, staying in, staying in 300 US dollar a night hotels at a time when I was, was, was actually scrunting and didn't yet start my business. But nobody attended class. They would come on the first or the first and second days. 
and they would leave at the 10 o'clock recess and not come back for the rest of the day and then they didn't even attend the full week and here they were being sent to study this global this new emerging tourism market this ecotourism which is the most beautiful least alienating form of tourism sustainable in, in which trinidad and tobago is particularly well positioned and they never they never attended the class so the tourism ecotourism product of trinidad of which the nylon pool would qualify has just been left to run on its own course and then while i was at the at the program one of the professors came and said you know there's a world bank conference for government ministers because the world bank is putting in special facilities loan facilities to upgrade tourism capacities of the caribbean so caribbean governments are sending all of their ministers and permanent secretaries to come and hear about this new fund this loan facility to upgrade old and aging infrastructure because the rest of the world is building so much new tourism product that our part of the world is left out on and it's not properly financed that i should attend and i should go to the conference but you wouldn't believe it a whole conference 300 suited caribbean governments all the governments of the caribbean send their delegates everybody in jacket and tie with and I just went as a normal average citizen in a t-shirt and a thing and I went and I sat in and listened to it. Ten o'clock break. They can fifty percent left. Twelve o'clock lunchtime. After lunch there were nine people left of three hundred. Have you ever heard the term junket? Oh my god. Have you ever heard the term junket? That's what people in state office consider these things. It's called a junket. A junket is you get sent to a seminar somewhere in the world, you don't go to the actual seminar, you go to enjoy yourself. Oh so, you, so the state spent money sending a person to educate the person and the person comes back without the education that they went to get. But be that was before the invasion of crime. Now, I don't know because an ecotourism facility is not a barbed wire and it's an open air community integrated community sharing nature enthusiastic type of person will go there to enjoy nature of which you would also want to integrate with the community do farming with them eat their food lying with them but trinidad has become a, like a war zone now so i don't know the latest actual report from the tourist sector literally list trinidad as the most dangerous place in the caribbean don't go there oh gosh don't go there and that is ridiculous because tobago should be the number one tourist destination on the planet. There is nowhere as beautiful as Tobago. Well, Tobago's, and, and Tobago's no Pigeon Point jetty, with the hut at the end, has become iconic. It is a symbol of wealthy tropical destination. And, and what's ironic is they use that image, but don't go to Tobago. Look at Rwanda is a massive tourist destination. Colombia, a massive tourist destination. I call in these places because 10 years ago they were murder capitals of the world. Look at what proper governance has done. A proper plan to monetize and maximize. And that's what we're talking about. But I want to say this because I did stay on and I studied enthusiastically when I was there in Washington. And I was asked to work for the UN and I, I, I refused. But I want, I want to say this. Trinidad and Tobago is arguably the most biodiverse country on the planet because biodiversity is not measured by number of species rather it is measured by number of species per oh, size yeah. so even though we only have let's say 193 for instance bromeliads because of our size, it's considered to be more, you can see more bromeliads, more orchids, more birds per square foot than anywhere else. Even more fish, except for the Philippines. Philippines is in front of us. So Costa Rica and Brazil in the past 20 years have shut off with their tourism product based on marketing biodiversity. Trinidad and Tobago hasn't done anything. We haven't created any infrastructure any legislative infrastructure. Boss, if you can't put a bikini on it and wine on it, that's the only kind of tourism we know. 
we call it 375,000 people that we get for the carnival product something the, the there's a cathedral in France that burnt down it still gets more tourists than the entirety of Trinidad and Tobago we we continue to vote in the office people who don't understand we call Trinidad Carnival yeah. the greatest show on earth we can't even sell the broadcast rights nobody wants to see it Rio Carnival the sub carnivals that they have every month you know Rio has carnivals in communities every month of the 12 months of the year that bigger than Trinidad Carnival that leads up to their main carnival or, or New Orleans or their Mardi Gras what those things bring and their, their, their communities and their country approach carnival as a business so yes. it, is, it, is, it is in your best interest to support culture and grow culture because culture brings in money is in your best interest to protect your forest. Tobago have one of the oldest forests in the world. I was told that it is the rules that were written to protect Tobago's forest is what they use in the United States to protect Yellowstone Park. We don't even know the things that are here. And we will find out after they're gone. I was fortunate to have walked through the ruins of the sugar mill with the big wheel in Tobago that they let burn down. I mean... When I walked through it, nature was reclaiming it. But it was such a marvelous experience. My children will never see it. Yeah. And they will never understand. You step back into history. I want to say something. I have an opportunity to say it now. Because you mentioned Invaders Bay, and I'm seeing a correlation between Invaders Bay and the Aripo Savannah's litigation. And, and what it was is that in Invaders Bay, the Pandey regime laid in Parliament and passed the National Environmental Policy which spoke about no net loss of mangroves and two weeks later they were bulldozing Invaders Bay. It, so we felt that it was important to defend the parliamentary process that passed this special law to protect mangroves. Likewise in Aripo Savannas they're putting a highway next to one of the wealth, one of the wealth generating capacities of Trinidad. We talk about ecotourism. We will teach the animals out across the highway. They can't do it. We will teach the, them. The, we will put crossing the, guards. The, Gary, are being sarcastic. The, the, the Aripo Savannas was a case fought to defend the professional staff who will very shortly no longer work at the EMA because seven of the nine professional staff who have to review the application said do not approve it. Do not. The way, it is, the way the application is written, they condemn it. Why should Trinidadians care? And the managing director said, no. Why should Trinidadians I care? Their They're looking at Gary Abud as obstructionist. Why should, I feel like a channeling for Zir Mohammed there. But why should Trinidadians care? When they're looking at it and the government and the PR people saying, we need this highway for development. The hell with the hairy blue crab. But they don't understand. There's no traffic that's going to be alleviated. It's going to create a shortcut that everybody who goes through the Valencia Bypass, the Valencia Bypass already solves the problem, problem. if you're going yes. there. All they need to do is to widen that Valencia stretch to, to channel that, that traffic into the Grandi area and to bypass it around Grandi because the bottleneck occurs in Grandi. Taking this highway from Kumuto, which only has a few hundred people living, and the road to get to the Kumuto, to that Aripo Savannas, you're going to have to put major road infrastructure in an area that doesn't have a population. So why are you putting in all that infrastructure in an area? Why should Trinidadians care about the environment? Why should they care about the animals? Why? Because that's the question they're going to ask. And, and, and that is the insipidity of this country. That we don't understand that tomorrow has a value too. It's not just now. So we will hunt all. If they tell us you can hunt and kill and eat all, we'll hunt and kill and eat all. We, they, we. They've done us something as a people, Gary, where people don't care about each other. We care, but we don't care. But the country wants development. And we are supportive of development. We're not a tree-hugging NGO, but development should occur in a way that is truly sustainable in that wealth will be created. 
just past the United States of America as the most econo um, competitive economy in the world. I want to say all of this so you understand me. They just surpassed the United States of America as the most competitive economy in the world. It is half the size of Trinidad and Tobago. They have 5 million people living there and they have more sustainable um, environmental policies like the 50-50 um, green space rule. So I'm saying to you, all of the things that we want, we could have. All of it. We could, Trinidad and Tobago's population could be 10 million people and we could live in harmony with the environment. The country is 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 run like a, I don't even want to say like a parlor. People in parlors know what they're doing. The country is run by people who come into office representing people who want to build about nine big projects so they could come out at the five years with a billion. Because that's the goal. To go and sit on Miami Beach and clink Prosecco I, and I, pretend I, they're I, successful. I grew up on Mervyn de Souza and Francis Pervat and John O'Halloran. Sam P. Wallace. And Eric Williams. And yeah. Do you know that the Justice Department in the United I, States, Trinidad and Tobago, and Sam P. Wallace was a test case that made the law? Trinidad and Tobago, Johnny O'Halloran, and Sam P. Wallace. And, and the, and the um, Carney Racing Complex. Do your research and you'll find that this country's notoriety is global and far-reaching. Your work as... I, I, I grew up on p &M corruption. So I was a supporter of the ONR, but I was more of a supporter of an alternative to get away from the corruption. I didn't know what the ONR would bring. That was Carl Hudson Phillips. I didn't know. I didn't know them. I didn't really know enough about them. But they promised something different to the corruption that we lived in, that we grew up on. Trinidad and Tobago has not evolved from that corruption. We went from the PNM into Pandy, and that was a disaster. We went back to the PNM with Manning and back to Kamala, and everybody knows that was a disaster. Now, where are we going now? So people are looking for an alternative, and people are desperate. Half a billion dollars was spent restoring buildings that while it is nice oh, to have but, but we do not need them right now. The Manning government set up the special purpose companies which like TITCO set up in the old guard PNM TITCO. And run this tenders process. All of these are they, it's, just, it's just they, a hide. Hide and just, thief. Hide and thief. Hide and thief because they don't have to comply with any tendering procedures. They don't report to parliament and they be I've on asked a question. I've asked a question. The company that was given the roofing contract for the Red House. Nobody know them. The company that got the doors contract. You can find them on Google. I did a video. We googled every single way that you could find asset industries innovative and couldn't find it. We had the people from directory inquiries live on air searching every possible mechanism to find asset innovative who got a hundred million dollars worth of contracts, 51 million of which was doors. We could have spent, we could have put in. 25,000 doors in the Red House. Gary, the insanity that went on there. There's another company called Unicom. And Unicom, so Unicot, which is the special purpose company that is project managing Red House and President's House and Whitehall, that company appoints project managers in their company and then gives contracts to companies who then subcontract it out. Now, come on. That's five layers of expense and, and that we don't need. And all it does is cloud transparency. How does Unicom decide who they're giving contracts to is outside of the purview of the Freedom of Information Act. Do you understand that? So if I give it to John Smith Limited. Yeah, you hide it. John Smith could do everything after that. Yeah, yeah. All the corruption, all the kickback, all the bribery could happen between John Smith and everybody else. And the simple question I am asking is this. In something that you say, they say, is as specific and as, as technical as restoration. You say that. You say that this is not something that you could just pelt a stone at cool. I accept that. Then how did you arrive at a company like Unicom? And how did they then subcontract everything else?
So why did they get the contract? We spent $60 million on the electricals of the Red House. Gary, $60 million will rewire the Twin Towers on Independence Square. It's $60 million they're talking about, you know. That is the insanity that is taking place in this country. And what you're talking about here just now, raising that issue of these special purpose companies, EFCL, EMBD, on the corner of Tragreed Road, and Paul Carew Street. There is a school that used to be that was there since 1903, Woodbrook Presbyterian, the children's school. And the completion date on the board is 2014. It is 2020. We know closer to it, and it is managed by the EFCL. If I go to the EFCL, the Freedom of Information Act, request, and they tell me we gave the contract to John Smith, there is no way to pass. What John happens Smith. after that? So it brings me back to what I'm saying because in support of, of your point is that when I was a young man we hoped that the ONR and then the NAR would solve the problem. We hoped and they didn't. The solution is not to depend on the political change. The solution is, is that every citizen is responsible for that change. All of us. Absolutely. And your listeners need to take that message home and to talk to other people because a lot of your listeners are listening in an armchair approach for those that have stayed this long. And they have that distance approach. Well, Philip is saying they are not Gary doing with the environment. We can depend on them. It doesn't, work. It doesn't work like that. They sit down and eat their popcorn and they win this and one song. They're yeah. looking at a show. Yeah, it's entertaining. Yeah. People need to get up and get out there to inform themselves, to spread the word, and to live the life of integrity. I have made bad decisions in my life and I have lived with them. But I've made good decisions as well. I have been offered corruption in my life, in activities that I have been doing, that I accepted and couldn't sleep for months later. And months later, call and call it off and slept better than ever. And those are the personal journeys that I'm, and I'm not judging anybody for being corrupt. But you have to. What are you saying? No. Listen to me now. People can redeem. No, 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 no. Yeah, People can redeem and repent. I am a full supporter of redemption. And yeah, I'm, yeah. But, 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 but as the Bible say, confess and sin no more. Confess and sin no more. And I think, I think for me, if I had done that million dollar deal that was offered to me by the Tobago House of Assembly on a property that I was selling in Tobago that they were willing to pay double the price for, but I had to pay the kickback. If I had accepted that, I don't think I could have accepted to come here today. No, because you wouldn't have the moral authority anymore. If I have wouldn't a, have the moral If you have a conscience, it would, it, would, it would fight you. So I have to yeah. say, thank God for them for approaching me with that I want to tell you this. Because I wouldn't know myself. I know. I, Oops, sorry. But, but at the oh. same token. I know. At the same token, if someone has accepted and gone down that road, I still think you could redeem yourself and come back into the world. You could. But we have to help each other. We cannot attack each other. We are, we are still all here together. So we have to be able to come forward and embrace the worst people and encourage them to be better people. Because otherwise we'll have civil war. Because 60% of the country are in support of corruption. That's how to get things done. I was on a flight coming back from overseas and I'm talking to the flight attendant. One of them is totally against corruption. One of them husband is a contractor with Wasa. And she's saying, yeah, well, how the country will run without a little corruption? I don't read it. They, they've been compromised. They wouldn't get work with Wasa unless they're corrupt. You can't get a more corrupt entity than Wasa. And look, we can't. do you know we are paying $600 million a year for Wasa from the Salcott? Why should we even be buying the Salcott water when we are throwing away water from all of our freshwater rivers? The water could be dammed and channeled and Sent back into storage. Talking like a pepper now, though. Listen, we said that. We asked, how did we design a water management system that catches the bounty of rainfall to dump it in the sea? Who was the idiot? Who was the idiot? Who is the idiot that allows it to continue? Us. Us. You just said something about rationalization. 
Wayne Dyer said, when you rationalize, you tell yourself rational lies. And like your friend who said the country needs to have a little bit of corruption, that's bullshit. You don't need any corruption at all. What you need is proper management and everybody get the opportunity to maximize their full potential. But cheaters need corruption. People who don't think that they could make it on their natural ability, they need to gang up against the rest of us and they need to use public office and access the public office because that's a big thing now, you know. A big thing now is to be a financier. You're out in the parties and you're boasting which minister you have in your pocket, you know, in this dot, in this postage stamp. There is an Air Force base in the United States bigger than Trinidad. One man have the contract to mow the lawn. We, in Trinidad and Tobago, we live like there is no tomorrow. Raising children in a country where we are burning down their future. Yeah, but it could stop if your audience spreads the story, talks to other people, say, look, we have to do something, but there's that disconnect, and I don't know, when I was a much younger person and we started FFOS, we thought and we hoped that there would have been a landslide of morality and public participation. All ideal, let's start like that, I know how that feels. Yeah, and I still think that it could happen, it, it could be a landslide of public conscience. When we first started the Jericho Project, and that was about 25 years ago, and that was to deal with the orphans, I remember sitting on a, in, a, in, in a meeting with Jericho Project board members, and Robin Montano, the attorney, was there, and Rene Cummings, the criminologist, was there, and a couple other people, and somebody from the media was there. And at that time, the, the idea, the accepted idea was that, that, that no issue of the orphans will be on the news, and people already care about that. And, and in five years, we had an event called the Justice for Children March, and we put 25,000 people on the road. And it woke people up to the plight of children at risk and the orphans, and it forced the government to go and proclaim the Children's Authority Act, and it got subventions. There were orphan homes that were getting children from the state, that the state was sending children to the orphan homes, but they weren't funding them. So how you were supposed to mind these children? And and it solved those problems. So I've seen firsthand, I've seen the work that you did and other people like you. But I live in a country where to pave the savannah for a two-day romp, they dump a truckload of gravel on Eden Shan. And he could have dead. He could have dead. I remember, I remember, um, how they treat Kublai Singh when he, he trying to fight for a sustainable... We could have both. You said it earlier. You could have as much capitalism as you want, but you could have capitalism with compassion. Yeah. Because globally, the conversation is now that 1% has more wealth than all... 99%. And yeah. listen, but, but the bottom 20% and it's it's unsustainable you're getting to a point now where the world will collapse on itself trinidad and tobago needs to look around at what it's doing with its devil take tomorrow attitude a lot of people feel well if it get bad i go jump on a plane and fly out even if that's your mindset and you liquidate everything you have we're getting the u.s from to take it out of the country we don't even have u.s you have to go in the bank every day and line up for 200 u.s every day if you're trying to go on a vacation. So if you're trying to liquidate to fly out of Trinidad Tobago, you're going and start over somewhere. Forget the liquidation. You're going to work in the next man country. And if you don't have a green card and you don't have a citizenship, then you're going and work under the table to take under the table abuse, to take under the table money instead of stopping and thinking because it's not easy outside there if you're starting over and you're hiding from ICE, the immigration uh, people. We, the people, you said it just now, and this will always be the reason and the rationale, rationale that all of us together, if we put aside our... We, I differences, mean, yeah. Okay, Brother Marvin said it well. We are a brotherhood of the boat. All of us, our ancestors come here on a different boat from a different place for a different reason. Some was kidnapped, some was hoodwinked, some was running away. But forget that, we here... This is our collective condition now. If we burn it down, because I watch my father, my dad, he's in his late 70s now, but he had um, encephalitis and he had to have surgery. So when I tell people this same man 10, 15 years ago was jumping over walls, he could have run and play. Now I have to hold his hand and, and, and he had to walk with me. And 
And at some point, we all get to that place. At some point, we all get too old to do and somebody else. But we have to then live the consequences of the nation that we left behind. Even if you're the most selfish fool in the world, you have to think about how will I survive when I am a very old man in this country? Last night, a police officer called me. He in tears. His mother had a heart attack last night. She lives in Coover. Rush her to the Coover Health Facility. The Coover Health Facility can't deal with her. They pack in two ambulances of humans to ship them to San Fernando Hospital. They're waiting for the second ambulance, like a maxi taxi, waiting to be full to move. This woman have a heart attack. Eh? Reach down into San Fernando and their emergency room in a mess. And this woman sitting, waiting to be attended to while having a heart attack in a nation that we are spending five billion dollars a year on public health this is ridiculous i'll continue like this gary the message has to be you've been doing this too long and 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 i think that you've earned your stripes i think you've earned the right to say to trinidad and tobago because you've sacrificed a large part of your life that you could have used publishing what you're eating tonight showing pictures of every fetcher and selfies from from on the dance floor you've used your life your limited life the, the thing that you can't replace you've used it fighting for issues that affect all of us shouldn't trinidadians and tobagonians because they just watch the government that tried to heavy hand me over the president's house and the red house who promised me five pre-action protocol letter letters are now backing off and giving the public releases because the public stood up and said eh -eh, we're not accepting this one we're not they're not accepting those numbers and the prime minister felt a pushback that he didn't expect that Trin and and i asked Trinidadians, we fought for jumbo when they throw jumbo out the oval from selling his peanuts remember that so that sunshine snacks alone could sell and and the country pushed back and next thing you know jumbo get a nice contract with sunshine snacks and everybody happy trinidadians need to know their power and they need to use it for each other and for this country that has to be your legacy and people like you lincoln myers you remind me of lincoln myers lincoln myers who died raul panton raul panton was one catch-ass journalist but a man with ethics and integrity to the grave. To the Lincoln group. was my friend, actually, and my mentor. When he went and he fasted on the against corruption, against transparency, yeah, you're on the transparency, yeah, on the whole since, of justice. Since when are days, yeah, that was the NAR. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and and they've been good people. You said, and and somebody said to me, a few good people are all that stand between us and the darkness. I believe that. I wonder what this country would be if the government didn't have to consider that there still are people who are willing to stand up for everybody else. You could imagine if Trinidadians stood up for themselves, what this place could be. If we could just purge ourselves of race. You see this race insecurity is killing us. It's killing us. And you see it's so thick with the UNC and the PNM. The NAR brought together a group of people that were bipartisan to race, that wanted better, that were tired of the old guard and wanted something new and fresh. And then collapsed in a heap of racism. When Bastille Pandey took his Indians and left and Robbie went and became the only of Ife in Africa. We can't seem to escape this bogey. I don't know why. Yeah. The colonials divided us by race. And the colonials left August 31st, 1962. And we still continue on their foolishness. But on the ground, in the gym, in the party, running around the savannah, climbing on the block, eaten by the doubles box, we're not racist. So why are we racist? Why did David Rudder get to say how we vote is not how we party? Why do we allow ourselves to be divided racially, politically, and in everything else, we okay? Why? I can't answer can't answer and I don't know what the end is. Perhaps we need to be threatened by something that could be a common threat that could unify us into one. I, I don't know. There's a mystery that we face. It, it, it's the quandary that we face that's keeping us back. We don't have, I remember I met when, um, when the Manning government was doing the smelters 
they brought in a whole bunch of European and international experts to have a, a conference. And I attended at that time with um, a person that I no longer associate with. But um, there was a guy from Norway who spoke. And after he spoke, I went and I spoke to him privately. And I said, you know, it's an amazing uh, presentation that you've given because it sounds as though your country are all in favor of the aluminum. And he said, actually, no, we're not all in favor. But we have conflict. But our conflict is always leans on the side of what is best for Norway. We don't have a division. When our parliamentarians sit, we have different political parties, but they are all nationalistic. They all want the best for Norway. He said, in your country, it's like being in different countries. And they get together in parliament and they fight and they squander and they disagree for disagreement's sake. There's no nationalism in this country. And it's a man who didn't know much about Trinidad, who just came to present at a conference. And it rang home because I agree and I followed Norway and the Norwegian model of development and how far they've gotten with so much less oil and gas than us. And they have a standard of living that's 10 times higher than ours. But free everything and limited work. the best education, the best hospital. Because they weren't creating millionaires, they go and clink glasses on Miami Beach. That will continue to be the problem. That we have a rogues gallery alluded to it. Of of each government that come to power, there was one defining project that you know. They stole money with that. The names come up that these people stole our money. Yeah. I would like as a prime minister to go and meet with Justin Trudeau and say, boss, you see them towers in Scarborough in Toronto? Johnny O'Halloran stole that money from Trinidad and Tobago. This is the evidence. I'd like you to return our property. Yes. Yeah. And I know his grandson, his grandson travels around the world for his classes on a permanent holiday. That is cursed money, cursed wealth. I, I can't understand it. And likewise today you have children and grandchildren of all kinds of corrupt families. I don't want to call names, but they're so well known and they operate Outside of the radar. Gary, if they put me in the parliament, the first time I stand up in the parliament, I will name every name. I want you to hear me say that. We cannot continue on as if what happened in the past doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. From September 1st, 1962 to now, an accounting has to take place and somebody has to lead that accounting. And I remember we had settled the Tesoro matter and Shell matter and that's what precipitated, or so they say, the 1990 attempted coup. But Robbie wasn't the right man for them because the right man for them would have put them in a cage or put them in a box. You need to defend this country. You need to defend the people of this country. Even the people who've died and gone to their grave in poverty and squalor and suffering because we've had corrupt white collars and parliamentarians and public servants and unethical professionals who only thought that access to public office is a chance to feather their own nest and enrich themselves. We need to undo that. The rest of the country going forward, the nationalism you're looking for, they will believe in that flag. If the government gives the flag, the authority and the respect it deserves. We say one people under one flag is the only way to get rid of that racist bogey that you're talking about. That's what we need to unite as, with common purpose. Make this a better country for everybody. Like a rising tide lifts all boats. That's where we need to go. Give me your closing comments. My closing comment is that you have a good chance to get into Parliament. I hope you do. Because even though it's, in my opinion, 60% of the country condone, accept, and even support corruption, if you could solidify the 40% who are God-fearing and have a public conscience and a personal conference into one unified body, that 40% could beat the 60 because the 60 would be split in two. If you could solidify a, a, a group, the moral, a moral majority, who might be a minority, then then there is a hope. Um, so I wish you all the best. I think you've done a good job. I hope that you would allow me to say this, that I think it's very important that we recognize that we live in a conservative society, so it's important that we are gentle in our ideas because people can't take People, a lot of people are old, conservative, and very quiet, quiet old people, and very conservative, and they're afraid of too much of a rocking boat. 
so we have to be very gentle in how we coax them into I feel like that in my life because oftentimes you go into court on a battle and the, the judge actually don't like us because we've jarred the judge but we it's a difficult balance because we believe you have to jar the society to wake up on the one hand but if you jar it too much then you offend more than you would a week and so it's a, it's a difficult balance I wish you all the best Philip I wish you all the best it's a, it's a lifelong journey you're on and I hope I can be of some support thanks a lot for that Gary that was hopefully the first of many conversations we're going to have. Gary Abood brings to the national conversation a lot of we a wealth of knowledge, but he also brings decades now of sacrifice and experience. And he is a living example. He carries, he walks on the shoulders of giants that he named in his conversation, but he represents and people like Gary represent and, and in a perfect country, it is the people who are willing to set aside personal interests for national interests that are going to make the better country that we're all looking for. And I am hoping that people like Gary and others like him are the examples that the young people, especially looking on, choose to follow and emulate with your life. Having wealth, on uh, ostentatious wealth, is no benefit to you if you're not happy. If you're living in a country where everybody full of fear, you drive out of a gated community, the minute the gate closes behind you, you're in danger. What's the point? Let's get together and fix the whole country so we could take out the burglar bars from on the windows so that nobody have any interest. They have countries in the world, I, I, again, I want to go back to places like Japan. Businesses don't close their doors anymore because nobody have any interest in stealing. Could we get there? Absolutely. We have more good people than bad. Our majority, of our, our good majority is a silent majority. And again, we need to flip that script and change that. Thank all of you for watching. This has been Plain Talk. Stay safe, Trinidad and Tobago.